grounded in the Word. Let's, let's turn to the Word of God, Psalm 19, for our scripture reading. I'll read the first, the odd-numbered odd verses, and Pastor Don will lead you in the even-numbered verses. Shall we stand as we read God's Word? Which one? 79. 79. Oh, you said 19. <laughs> oh, did I say 19? <laughs> Try 79. Yeah. O oh God, the heathen are come into thine inheritance. Thy holy temple have they defiled. They have laid Jerusalem in heaps. The dead bodies of thy servants they have given them to be meat unto the fowl of the heaven, the fish of the sea, unto the beasts of the earth. Their blood have they shed like water round about Jerusalem, and there is none to bury them. We are become a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and a derision to them that are round about us. How long, O Lord, wilt thou be angry forever? Shall thy jealousy burn like fire? Pour out thy wrath upon the heathen that have not known thee, upon the kingdoms that have not called upon thy name. For they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his dwelling place. O oh, remember not against us former iniquities. Let thy tender mercies speedily prevent us, for we are brought very low. Help us, O God, of our salvation, for the glory of thy name, and deliver us and purge away our sins for thy name's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is their God? Let him know among the heathen the sight of the revenging of the blood of thy servants which is shed. Let the sighing of the prisoner come before thee. According to the greatness of thy power, preserve thou those that are appointed to die. And render unto our neighbors sevenfold unto their bosom their reproach, wherewith they have reproached thee, O Lord. And so we have, and so we thy people and the sheep of thy pasture will give thee thanks forever. We will show forth thy praise to all generations. Let's pray. Father, even as the psalmist is bemoaning the destruction of Jerusalem and the sad and tragic consequences upon your people, because of your righteous judgment. Lord, is it, even as he is calling out for your tender mercies, we pray, Lord, that even today we might realize the consequences of sin and that we might cast ourselves, Lord, upon your mercy and upon your grace, that we might find help in our time of need. Speak to our hearts through the word today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. As we move through the Bible, we've come to the end of 2 Chronicles this week, chapters 35 and 36. And tonight, John will be bringing us a commentary on these two chapters. I enjoyed so much the commentary last Sunday night and looking forward to tonight as we look again at chapters 35 and 36, moving through the Bible, here looking at 2 Chronicles. This morning, I'd like to draw your attention to the 36th chapter and verses 15 through 16. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up often and sending them because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God. They despised his words. They misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose 
against his people till there was no remedy. Those words, no remedy, are sometimes the most terrifying and frightful words that a person can hear. You've not been feeling well. You finally go to the doctor. He puts you through a series of tests. And then he finally calls you and informs you that you've waited too long to come and visit him. The condition has progressed to that point that you better set your house in order because according to medical science, there is no remedy for your condition. How those words just sort of cut a person's heart. How they bring such desolation and despair. No remedy. In all of science, there is no remedy. As fateful as those words are from the mouth of your doctor, they're even more fateful when they come from the mouth of God. When God analyzes the situation of a person's life and God declares of that person, there's no remedy. We read here in 2 Chronicles, Moreover, all of the chief of the priest and the people, they transgressed very much after the abominations of the heathen. They polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord, the God of their fathers, sent them his messengers over and over because he had compassion on his people and upon his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God. They despised his words. They misused his prophets until the wrath of God arose against his people, till there was no remedy. Dr. L. Edison Alexander wrote these words. There is a time, we know not when, a point, we know not where, that marks the destiny of man to glory or despair. There is a line by us unseen that crosses every path, the hidden boundary between God's mercy and his wrath. To pass that limit is to die, to die as if by stealth. It does not quench the beaming eye or pale the glow of health. The conscience may still be at ease, the spirit's light and gay. That which is pleasing still may please and care be thrust away. But on that forehead, God has set indelibly a mark unseen by man, for man as yet is blind and in the dark. And yet the doomed man's path below may bloom as Eden bloomed. He did not, does not, will not know or feel that he is doomed. He knows, he feels that all is well, and every fear is calmed. He lives, he dies, but he wakes in hell, not only doomed, but damned. Oh, where is that mysterious bourne by which our path is crossed, by which God himself hath sworn that he who goes is lost? How far may we go on in sin? How long will God forbear? Where does hope end and where begin the confines of despair? An answer from the skies is sent. Ye that from God depart, while it is called today, repent and harden not your heart. Judah had crossed over that line. They had gone so far that God declared there's no remedy. The writer gives us a symptom of this deadly condition. He said the chief priest, the people, had transgressed very much 
following the abominations of the heathen. We read that the people were worshiping Ashtoreth, who was the goddess of sex. They were worshiping Molech, <coughs> who was the god of pleasure. They were worshiping Baal, who was the god of the intellect. They worshiped Mammon, who was the god of material possessions. That is, the people were absorbed in pornography, in sex, in pleasure, and in material possessions. There was no time or place for God in their lives. We read that they polluted the house of the Lord. Now, they went to the house of the Lord ostensibly to worship, but while there, their minds were not really upon the Lord. Their minds were upon other things. They were thinking of the appointments that they needed to make this following week in order to keep up uh, their quota that is required at the job. They were thinking about some person they just had met and maybe were very interested in, or they were wondering if the angels are going to keep their winning streak. These were the things that occupied the minds of the people as they sat in the temple to worship. God had compassion on them, though, and so he sent his messengers to them. And one of the messengers that God sent was Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was told by the Lord to go down to the temple where the people were gathering to worship the Lord. And he said, stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim this word. Say to them, hear the word of the Lord, all Judah, you that are entering into the gates to worship the Lord, for thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. But trust not in lying words, saying, this is the temple of Jehovah, the temple of Jehovah, the temple of Jehovah are these. That is, God is saying, don't believe that just because you're still going to temple that everything is okay. For the Lord said, if you will thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you will thoroughly execute judgment between man and his neighbor, if you will not oppress the fatherless or the stranger or the widow, if you will not shed innocent blood in this place, neither walk after the other gods to your hurt. Then I'll cause you to dwell forever in this place that I have given to your fathers. Behold, you are trusting in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom you know not, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and will you say, well, we are free to do all of these abominations? Is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I have seen, saith the Lord, but go now unto my place, which was in Shiloh, where I first set my name. See what I did because of the wickedness of my people Israel. And now because you have done all of these works, saith the Lord, as, and I spoke to you rising up early and speaking, but you would not hear. I've called to you, but you would not answer. Therefore, I will do this house, which is called by my name, wherein you trust, and unto the place which I have given to you and your fathers, I'll do as I've done to Shiloh, and I will cast you out of my sight as and will cast out all of your brethren, even all of the descendants of Ephraim. And then the Lord said to Jeremiah, Do not pray for these people. Do not cry or pray for them. Do not make intercession to me 
for I will not hear you. They had gone too far. There was no remedy. They were religious, but they were not spiritual. They had crossed over the line. And God said to Jeremiah, don't pray for them anymore. Don't make intercession for them anymore. They've crossed over the line. There's no remedy. If you pray, I won't hear you. Tragically, we read concerning the people that they had mocked the messengers of God. They mocked the words of Jeremiah. In fact, they put Jeremiah in the dungeon for daring to speak against the wicked lives that they were living. The Lord said, they despised my words. They misused my prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against the people till there was no remedy. Jeremiah, don't even pray for them anymore. They've gone too far. I believe that there is really more hope for a man who declares that he is an atheist than for a man who says he believes in God and yet he lives as though God does not exist. He never takes time to talk with God. He never takes God into consideration before making decisions. God really has no part in his life. This was the condition of Judah. If you had taken a poll there at the temple, 95% of them would have declared that they believed in God, but they were living as though God did not exist. There were many other gods that they were serving, gods that had a higher priority in their life than the true and the living God. Your God is revealed very often by the primary interest of your life, such things as riding a Harley or things of that nature things that are very important to you, things that occupy your mind, your heart, that becomes your God. And though you may be sitting in the house of God, yet God is looking at your heart, and he sees what's in your heart today. Notice, they were not denying the existence of God. They still held the truth of God, but they were holding it in unrighteousness. Paul the Apostle said, For the wrath of God shall be revealed from heaven against all of the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth of God in unrighteousness. Yes, still holding the truth, but holding it in unrighteousness. That's a very dangerous place to be because it is a place of great deception. A person often says, well, I know I'm not what I should be. I know I'm not doing what I should do, but I still believe in God and I still go to church. And in reality, though you may be there physically, you're not there in your heart. Your heart isn't in it. Your heart isn't with God. And thus you're deceived and it becomes a deception in your own mind as the poet said, and yet the doomed man's path below may bloom as Eden bloomed. He did not, does not, will not know or feel that he is doomed. He knows he feels that all is well and every fear is calmed. He lives, he dies, but he wakes in hell, not only doomed, but damned. They were going to temple and thus they felt a sense of spirituality. And if you looked at them, they looked like they were worshiping God. But in reality, God was looking at their heart and he saw something entirely different. 
Today you are here outwardly, but where are you in your heart? Men may be looking at you with admiration. They see that you're in church, and they say, my, he's in church. He must be a respectable, good man. But God is looking at your heart. And God sees what's there. And he sees all of the other gods that are being enthroned in your mind and in your heart today. And he realizes that he doesn't have first place. He's not really God in your life. Ezekiel is another one of the messengers that God had sent to Judah at this time in history. And Ezekiel tells us, Then said the Lord unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had dug in the wall, behold, there was a door. He said unto me, Go on in, and behold the wicked abominations that they are doing in there. So I went in, and I saw, and behold, I saw all of the idols of the house of Israel that were portrayed upon the wall about me. And there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. And in the midst of them stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan. And every man had his censer in his hand. And there was a thick cloud of incense that was going up. And then said the Lord unto me, Son of man, have you seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagination... For they say that the Lord seeth us not. The Lord has forsaken the earth. You see, here were the priests, these ancient men, the spiritual leaders supposedly of the nation. And God said to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, I've let you go inside of their minds. I've let you see what's going on in their minds. And this is what God was seeing when he was looking at him. And this is what God sees when he looks at you. He doesn't see your hands lifted as you sing praises to him. He's looking at your heart. He's looking in your mind. And he is seeing what is there. Even as he allowed Ezekiel that glimpse into the minds of the people, in the imaginations. This is what's going on in the imaginations. And then God showed to Ezekiel all of the other abominations that they were committing. And then God said, they've provoked me to anger. Therefore, will I deal with them in fury? My eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud cry, yet will I not hear them. There was no remedy. They had gone over the line. There is no coming back. And even though they cry with a loud cry, God said, no, they've gone too far. I won't listen. I wonder, for many of you, how close are you to that line today? Only God really knows. But it's very possible that some of you are hearing God's final call to your life today. This might be it. For the last time, God is calling you to turn from your sin, to forsake your sin, and to turn your life fully and completely over to him. One more rejection of his grace, and God will declare there's no remedy. Don't pray anymore for them. Let them go. I've given them up. In the book of Hebrews, the question is asked, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? How shall we escape what? How shall we escape the judgment of God, the fiery indignation of his wrath by which he will devour his adversaries? The Bible warns us about those who have trodden underfoot the Son of God, 
counted the blood of his covenant wherewith he was sanctified as worthless and have done despite to the spirit of grace. And as the writer says, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Today, God is again speaking to your heart. Today, God again is calling you away from the other gods that have become enthroned in your heart and in your mind. And he's calling you to a renewal of your commitment to love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, with all of thy soul, and with all of thy strength. And to forsake the flesh the path of sin, and to follow after Jesus Christ with all your heart. If you hear God's voice as he is speaking to you, be thankful. It means that there is still remedy. God is offering you the remedy for your sin today. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. But don't be deceived into thinking that that offer will always be there available for you. It is possible to cross over the unseen line. It is possible to go so far as did Judah, the people of God, to go so far that God will finally just shake his head and say, Jeremiah, don't pray for them anymore. That God will say as he did to uh, Ezekiel, though they cry with a loud cry, I'm not going to listen. There's no remedy. And he turns you over to destruction. Today, while it is yet called day, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, but surrender your life to him. Let's pray. Father, we realize that man's eternal destinies are in the balance. That there are those, Lord, who have been playing around with Christianity. But it's not something of their heart, their life. Yes, they believe that you exist, but they hold the truth of God in unrighteousness. For they continue in their unrighteous ways, in the unrighteous path, though avowing a belief in you. Lord, cause us this day to forsake the path of sin and to turn our hearts and lives fully and completely over to you. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Shall we stand? The pastors are down here at the front to pray for you. And if the Spirit of God has challenged your heart today, revealed to you what God sees, not pleasant. And you'd like to repent and turn your life over to Jesus Christ and give yourself to him before God says there's no remedy. I would encourage you, as soon as we're dismissed, make your way forward down here to the front. And these men are here and will be happy to pray with you that you might respond to the call of God's Spirit upon your heart today that you might be turned from darkness to light, from the power of Satan into the kingdom of God. May the Lord be with you, bless and keep you in his love as you go about your duties this week. May you be aware and conscious of the presence of God as his spirit speaks to your heart and to your life. And may we not just say, I believe in God, but may we 
look to him for guidance, for direction. May he become the most important thing in our lives. In Jesus' name. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. And be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up. On behalf of the Word for Today, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Chuck Smith, we thank you for joining us in today's broadcast. For more of Pastor Chuck's studies and biblical teaching resources, visit our website at pastorchuck.org. You can contact the Word for Today at the Word for Today, P.O. Box 890-820, Temecula, California, 92589 or email us at infopastorchuck at gmail.com. We'll return with more of our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study in our next broadcast with Pastor Chuck.